Hey folks, Joseph A. Savora here, and I'm doing a new movie review this week. And it's the most talked about films of all time, which eventually became one of my favorite films of last year, called Birdman, or The Unexpected Virtue of Ignorance. It's a comedy and drama about a washed up Hollywood actor who once played a superhero in all three of the blockbuster films called Birdman, who struggles his entire life between working on a play and having to do with his family situations that's going on. And just recently won Best Picture at the Oscars, you know, throughout the entire nominations that they had. And sad to say, you know, Michael Keaton didn't win Best Actor for his performance as Rick and Thompson. But he did won a Golden Globe for his performance, so... He did an awesomely good job playing that role. And he definitely took the risk on having to play that particular character no matter what he does. Yeah, and it's definitely right up there with his performance in Batman, Beetlejuice, Clean and Sober, and many others that follow. And he's definitely one of the most underrated actors of all time. That This film definitely did deserve his nomination. Without a doubt. And everybody was good in this film, too. But it's definitely the film that's not considered it as simply a superhero movie, as a lot of people were expecting it to be. And it's not even a parody of it, either. But there are times when it does try to become one. It sort of almost pays a tribute to Harvey Birdman, in that sort of way. Yeah, Harvey Birdman, attorney at law. <laughs> yeah, but the cartoon character, basically. Because, you know, Birdman does seem almost in the tradition of Harvey Birdman. But in reality, it's almost in the tradition of Batman, too, since Michael Keaton did play Batman in the first two films back in the late 80s and early 90s. So that was cool. And it has the idea of what was it like um, when it comes to having to see shots of, of actually dealing with all these uh, telekinesis powers and and levitation and all that, especially while wearing his underwear, and all his other shots that, that was going for, mostly the single shots that the director has chose. That's exactly what the film had to accomplish. It's mostly just focusing on, on theater life, so that's basically what the film's about. It's, it's, it has nothing to do with just, you know, superheroes in general. Although I would say they could have had focused more on that as, as the movie was going for. But that's okay, because it's exactly what they were hoping for. Uh, the movie stars Michael Keaton with Eric Norton, who's been best known for his role in Fight Club, Primal Fear, American History X, as well as The Incredible Hulk, and many others. Emma Stone, you know, who just recently was in all two of the Amazing Spider-Man movies. But she's also been best known for her roles in, in Superbad, Easy A, and Zombieland. Yeah, she was very good in this one, too. Naomi Watts, who's been in a lot of films, including King Kong Remake, The Ring, Mulholland, Mulholland Drive with David Lynch, and all his other other films in her career, even Eastern Promises with David Cronenberg. Zach Galifianakis, who's been best known for his role in The Hangover and been in, in several comedies and dramas. You know, he, he's a very good actor. I did enjoy his uh, role in this one. Andrea Reisebor with Amy Ryan, a very underrated actress who's been in films like The Departed and Gone Baby Gone. Meredith Reber, Jeremy Shamos, Frank Ridley, Catherine O'Sullivan, Damian Young, Lindsay Duncan, and Bill Camp. It's co-written, produced, and directed by Alexandro G. Anawutu, a, a Mexican uh, director who's been best known for his uh, films such as Beautiful and uh, Babel with uh, Brad Pitt and Kate Blanchett. 
Yeah, which I saw that from, so it's very good. So, <laughs> let's get right to it. The movie begins when a washed up Hollywood actor named Rickon Thompson, who's played by Michael Keaton, has been very famous for playing a superhero named Birdman in all three of the blockbuster films since the 90s, you know, starting in 1992, which, ironically enough, that was the year when Michael Keaton played his second turn of Batman in Batman Returns. So, <laughs> yep, that happens to be the year when Batman Returns came out, so that's cool. But anyway, he's being tormented by the voice of Birdman, which seems more like a cross between you know, his voice of, of Beetlejuice in the mix with Batman as a disguised voice. Yeah, so you can kind of tell that Michael Keenan did manage to do the voice. That's, that's sort of in that tradition. But it worked pretty well, though, because it almost did sound like Beetlejuice right there. So he actually wants up mocking and criticizing him throughout the entire film. And actually sees himself by performing a feats of levitation. You know, especially that scene where he was actually floating up on air, you know, with his underwear. <laughs> and actually uses telekinesis powers, where he goes around using these powers by, you know, grabbing a lot of stuff and throwing around the entire, you know, room. His job was to reinvent his career by writing, directing, and starring in a Broadway adaptation of a short story called What We Talk About When We Talk About Love by Raymond Carver. It's being produced by his best friend and lawyer named Jake, who's played by Zach Galifianakis, and it also stars his girlfriend Laura, who's played by Andrea Reisenberg, his first-time Broadway actress Leslie, who's played by Naomi Watts, and he also serves his daughter Samantha as his assistant, was played by Emma Stone, who just came out of rehab and you know, recovering from her drug addiction, yeah, which includes marijuana. So during rehearsals, a life fixture actually fell onto an actor named Ralph, which Riggins and Jake's had agreed to that it's ineffective. So Riggins wants up telling Jake that part of this was part of one of his telekinesis powers that he actually created that sense so that way he can actually replace Ralph with another actor to play. So Leslie's suggestion was to have uh, Riggins to replace Ralph with a brilliant uh, method actor named Mike Shiner who's played by Eric Norton in order for him to refinance his house to fund his contract. So during the first preview once of going to a complete disaster as Mike started to break character over the replacement of his gin with water because he was solidly drunk during that particular scene. And that's, yeah, because he goes around telling that all oh, this is fake, everything around except for the chicken because that was real. Yeah, he was going completely over the top. And he also attempts to have sex with Leslie during that one particular sex scene, which suddenly causes Riggins to read an early press coverage and it's insist that Mike has stolen the entire show. But Jake encouraged him to continue. But once Riggins had catched Samantha using marijuana, that's when the whole thing becomes a big you know, conversation between him and his daughter, mostly about importance, because he didn't want his life to go you know, straight to hell. Because he's been having a mental breakdown between all of this. And the fact that, that she wants to tell him that he's actually and expendable. I mean, he was talking about that he wanted to become relevant, but the fact that, you know, she's becoming the main focus of it, and the main reason why, you know, you're actually being who we are is because you want to actually mock everybody else, while you're the actual real deal. <laughs> yeah. And the fact that she's talking about, you mock the people at Facebook and and you don't even have a Twitter account or so on and so forth. <laughs> and all this other crap. Yeah, yeah. that's what also bothered me about the film. They always keep name dropping all this uh, latest today's technology that we're getting now. You know, involving the internet. And all these other social networks and and viral videos like YouTube. Yeah, You know, that that's starting to annoy the hell out of me every time I see films like this. Yeah, I mean, see, that was my concern about it because I had to see this movie twice, you know, just to get the idea. 
Especially when they started showing a close-up shot of of uh, Emma Stone right there, you know, you know, talking about his importance. Yeah, kind of, kind of over the top there, but you get the idea. But she was good though. And the fact that part of this was just his vanity project that he had to come up with, and so on and so forth. So then backstage during the final preview, Riggins winds up spotting Samantha and Mike flirting with each other. Yeah, between all these sets going around, and especially when he started changing around. And also the fact that Samantha was talking to Mike about, since they were about to, uh, since she was just already on top of the roof of the theater. You know, just yelling and, and all this stuff around the crowd. You know, he was talking about that his father isn't paying attention to her. Yeah, she's nothing but an attention for her. Anyway, Riggins suddenly accidentally locks himself out of the theater. Yeah, with his bathrobe. And suddenly, you know, since his bathrobe was stuck into the door. So he, he, took, it, he took his bathrobe off and he walks around in his underwear in front of the whole crowd in New York. Yeah, everybody was already cheering on because everybody had recognized the actor because he played Birdman. Everybody was screaming and shouting, Birdman! Birdman! Yeah, I know there was an early scene where, you know, one of uh, one of their fans that went inside the bar, you know, which Riggins was talking to Mike about the importance of acting and all his other stories and the fact that he was doing all this for years. And how, you know, how he started acting since, you know, he found a, uh, a napkin that he got from another actor who was drunk and everything. Yeah, he was just explained to him about how he got into acting. You know, he gave the, the fan an autograph to her and a picture because you know, he loves uh, the actor. Yeah, this is before we got to meet Tapper Bud Dickinson, an inferential but idiotic critic. Yeah, I didn't like it. So, um, part of that incident that happened, you know, where he was walking through Times Square to get it back inside the theater, you know, just to do his uh, part, you know, which involves a scene where, you know, where Mike and, and Leslie was in the bedroom and, and his boyfriend was about to, <laughs> yeah, his, his uh, first boyfriend was about to, a suicide attempt scene where he was actually playing on... <laughs> Yeah, you know, blowing his brains out right in front of them. After all of the preview had started, you know, all the amateur videos involving the incident that happened winds up going viral. Yeah, even the <laughs> yeah, Samantha started to show his uh, video on her cell phone. Yeah, which happens to be the, s the same cell phone that I have, which is right here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the uh, iPhone 5S that's blue really cool. <laughs> I, I got that recently um, in January. So yeah, and, and then um, Riggins actually winds up, uh, runs into the critic Tafaba and actually winds up complaining about the fact that she tells him that she hates him and the fact that all Hollywood celebrities that pretend to be actors and actually promise to kill his play. Uh, Riggins actually did something that no one else would do. And he took the rest to do this by yelling and screaming at Tafaba for giving a stupid review, that he, you know, all these negative reviews that he's been receiving, and the fact that all this stuff are just labels and labels and all this stuff. And why don't you just? And he says something like this: Why don't you just go take this stupid pen and shove it right down your Ripley ass? Yeah, that's what he actually said. And the fact that she gave a negative review without having seen it, Riggins winds up getting drunk and pass out in the street, which then the next day he hallucinates with a conversation with the Birdman himself. Yeah, which we finally got to see a shot of Birdman you know, flying around, and he has to see an action scene of, of a giant bird that's on top, you know, already, you know, attacking the entire city, and Birdman was about to stop him, you know, saving all the people around in, in New York. Yeah, that was an awesome scene right there. And the fact that he was doing that, that squawking voice. <laughs> and the snapping, you know, once he was walking around. And then he wants to be on top of the roof, you know, where one guy was telling him, Are you okay? You know, 
because he was already doing his attempt of doing a suicide one, but in reality it was just part of his hallucination. He was just actually jumped right into the building and actually started flying all the way around New York. <laughs> yeah, he flew all the way. Yeah, even between the shots of the the cars and, and the taxi cab and then suddenly it cuts directly to the scene where they show the, the feeder, so already preparing for opening nights. <laughs> Yeah, even with that taxi cab, you know, telling him to get his fare. Once he filed back to New York to the theater on opening night, Riggins suddenly, and this is one of the biggest uh, spoilers, and I'm gonna, I might as well get give away, but for those who haven't seen this, you know, don't bother watching this part. But Riggins actually used a real loaded gun for that particular final scene in which, you know, as we saw in the preview, his attempt to actually use the character by killing himself, he actually shot his nose on stage, which almost looked like he shot his head, but it actually went into his nose. He wants up earning a standing ovation throughout the entire crowd, the entire audience, except for that stupid critic, Tapical, who wants up leaving during the applause, but in the hospital, Jake actually told Riggins that Tafaba actually gave the play a rave review. Yeah, so at this rate, it's it's a positive review, dubbing his suicide attempt to become super realism, which is a new form of method acting, and actually using the title, The Unexpected Virtue of Ignorance. And that's the title, which actually became the title of the film. And this is one of the biggest ones, too. Um, was the ending of the film and that's the ending that did kind of bother me it's the kind of ending that this is the kind of ending that filmmakers or any other would love to add these days that really didn't work at all or it did or maybe they just wanted to keep it that way oh well but after his daughter Samantha had visited Riggins from the hospital Riggins wants of dismissing it as Birdman and wants of seeing birds outside and he wants of climbing up on the window ledge actually preparing to jump or it seems to be shot you know off screen because at this rate he was about to do an, a suicide attempt unless this was just you know this is just part of his hallucination or, or any other joke or the fact that he really did do all this so anyway when Samantha finally returns, Regan had disappeared. She wants up looking down to the street and then up in the sky and smiles. Now, what seems like this, it really bothers me. Because you never know if you actually see, you know, Regan's actually going up on top of the sky, you know, flying around with the rest of the birds. The fact that he became Birdman. Or, or maybe he just died already on the streets. I, I didn't even hear any screaming or anything from the background. But that's kind of what scares me <laughs> when I see scenes like this. But it's the kind of ending that I think it's one of the weakest. But that's exactly what the film is going for. And I would say this, it's definitely one of the best performances that Michael Keaton has ever done in his entire career as an actor. This is definitely right up there with his role in Batman, Beetlejuice, and Clean and Sober. He actually plays a role that no one else could actually play, and it was very strong and hard to do, that he actually had nailed it completely. But the fact is, you do feel sorry for the character because of the fact that he's, you know, he's been struggling throughout the entire life, you know, after having to play his character Birdman through all three of these films, and the fact that he's... <laughs> He's already dealing with, you know, reinventing his career by doing theater arts. It was really cool. I mean, they actually had a single shot that was done by an RE Alexa camera. Although I believe they might have used, you know, computers, you know, trying to get several of those shots, you know, without editing tools. But I think they might have used some editing on, on some point, but not all editing. It's just all shots particularly all the way around. Yeah, I think they might have used some dolly shots here and there you know, of, of the entire cast and crew going through the entire room, including all the dressing rooms, the hallways, the stairs, 
you know, everything narrow around and going right straight to the stage. You know, a lot of stage work that they're working on and shots of, you know, Telekinesis powers and floating around, all this floating, levitation, everything, and, and close-up shots, a lot. That was just perfect, the way that the director of Rod 2 actually did. And, and also, I, I like the fact that they even had a score that involves uh, a drummer, you know, just playing all these uh, jazz drumming throughout the entire film. And I thought it worked pretty well, in, in my opinion. Because, you know, I love um, drums, too. I mean, I used to play the drums, you know, when I was a kid, you know, going on, taking a music class. Yeah, I, I even loved to play the piano as well. It was really cool. It worked pretty well for the film. I mean, it almost feels like, you know, this is definitely a jazz vibe, you know, going to New York City you know, and hanging around and doing a lot of plays in the theater. You know, preparing for the new opening, the big opening for the film, for the stage. Play. What I also enjoy though was that because they filmed this this uh, theater at uh, St. James in New York, yeah, because that was a theater where they play a lot of plays, including the producers and all that. Yeah, St. James, and also um, the inside shot of it was actually, believe it or not, was shot. Um, which, believe it or not, though, actually, they, they shot it at, uh, at a theater, at a stage place called, uh, which is actually shot at a studio called Kaufman Astoria Studios. So those were just the stage and the backstage scenes, respectfully, for the movie, yeah, including the shots of, of all these ropes hanging out for all these light stages and you know, which I know one of them actually fell on them. It, it's perfect. And I knew exactly what the director wanted to, to do just to shoot this movie. And and I, I could see why these people really had tough times having to make this movie as possible. I mean, especially, you know, some of the scenes had to be, you know, doing some many takes. You know, some of them were ruined, but then they had to retake it again. You know, even though it was only six minutes or, or several more into it, yeah, it's it's perfect. I, mean, I love all the shots of, of New York and everything they go for. It's, it's a very particular atmosphere. So that's what the film had to accomplish, you know, and Michael Keaton definitely nailed it perfectly. And the director too, you know, this was this is definitely his best choice. Uh, the entire supporting cast, Eric Norton, he was very good as, as usual, in many roles he does. He was very effective as Mike, you know, the, the method actor who, who knew exactly how to, to do all this work, especially when he, he knew about all the mannerisms that Riggins had tried. Yeah, he thought that since he didn't actually uh, read this on the script, he actually memorized them by heart. Or by head, <laughs> by his mind, yeah, by heart and by his mind. So that's cool. But yeah. <laughs> but I also like the scenes when, you know, he was having a fight with uh, Riggins. Yeah, Riggins was beating the shit out of him. Yeah, while he was already, you know, in his underwear. Yeah, Mike. <laughs> it's such a funny scene, and there were plenty of funny scenes too. Uh, between you know, the Riggins and all the rest, and, uh, I just love this movie. It's 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 fascinating. I, I enjoyed it. I mean, I, I can see why some people wouldn't enjoy it as much as they could. I mean, besides the general public and all that, because it's not for everybody. It's it's the kind of film that you know, where you just want to watch it on, uh, no matter what happens at the end or or so. Yeah, and. No matter what happens to the character, you know, and how he's struggling, that's exactly what the film had to be about. It isn't just about, you know, fighting superhero. I mean, becoming a superhero and fight a lot of bad guys, a lot of things around the streets. And it, it, it did. I mean, it's great to see scenes like this, but the, even though the movie isn't really what it's all about, I mean, it is indeed about, you know, a man struggling to make it up to the top, you know, become more relevant, you know, instead of just becoming, 
you know, a has been, that sort of way. So I, now I can see how he felt. And I like that. And it's definitely, you know, his best work. So definitely check out Birdman or the Unexpected Virtue of Ignorance um, on DVD, Blu ray, and many other um, websites out there. You know, check this out. It's you know, you'll definitely have a good time watching it, or if if it's not, then that's okay. You know, I respect your opinions. But I enjoy this movie. It's one of my favorites um, as of last year. Even though last year was a very miserable year, uh, I didn't I didn't watch the Oscars that much. I mean, I know the he didn't win Best Actor award, even though he won a Golden Globe. Thank God for that one. His Golden Globes were underrated. I didn't care about the Oscars as much because, in fact, I haven't even watched the Oscars, not even this year, um, quite often. I mean, I was only busy, you know, you know, working around, washing some clothes, getting ready for school. But I was already looking up all the lists online and see which one won or which one didn't. And I'm happy that Birdman won. I'm even happy that Big Hero 6 won, which I was excited for. Even though I was so disappointed that some of the films were snubbed, like the Lego Movie, and even snubbed uh, Amy Adams' uh, Best uh, Actress Award for performance in, in Big Eyes, and yeah, she deserved better than that. But I'm glad she won a Golden Globe the second time around after her first uh, Golden Globe for the for the film American Hustle. So yeah, awesome movie. I enjoyed it. Check it out. So anyway, I give Birdman or the Unexpected Virtual of Ignorance a solid four stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.